Hi everyone. So if you're watching this video in the fall of 2019, um, I have made a few edits to this quiz uh, just to change it uh, just a little bit. It's very similar to the one that you would find on Blackboard, uh, but it is a little bit different. I put a copy of the PDF of this quiz in the video description below. Um, if you'd like to take a, uh, you know, print that out or whatever, and I'm going to go over all the questions uh, relatively briefly here, but I just wanted to know, let you know it is a little bit different than the one that you see that you may see on Blackboard. If you're not taking this in the fall of 2019, we've likely changed the Blackboard course. So that's basically that. So the first question is, it says use the given information or using, we should change that, use the given information below, predict the compound present in the unknown. C, explain your reasoning. So we have A, which is a standard, B, which is a standard, and we have C, which is an unknown mixture. So let's take a look at this. Well, there's two things that we want to notice. First of all, this is B. And there's two ways that we know that. The first way that we know that is because it has the same RF. So the distance between here and here and here and here, we don't see the exact solvent front here, but we, it has the same RF value. The other thing is it is the same uh, color um, here. That being said, they're not always colored, um, but the RF can tell you something as long as your um, unknown mixture would reasonably have B in it. What else does C have in it? C also has A in it, and again, has the same RF, it traveled the same distance, and also it's the same color on your um, on the PDF of this, this is a blue color, but on my printer it's black and white, so we see this gray color. So this is basically how we can identify this. C has both B and A, because it has the same spot as B, and the same spot as A, which are standards. This is very similar to what you have done um, in the lab experiment, except you did it on analgesics. All right, num letter B, or number two, sorry. In the separation of analgesics using TLC experiment, what was used for the stationary phase? Is it polar or nonpolar? So what did we use for the stationary phase? We used silica gel, which is basically sand, SiO2, and it has some OHs on it, and this is extremely polar. It's very important that we remember that the stationary phase in TLC, so look at gel TLC, is polar. Then it says rank the polarity of the three mobile phases below. So you use three different mobile phases, ethanol, acetic acid, and ethyl acetate. And we want to rank their relative polarities. Well, if we look here, ethyl acetate is in ester. Um, acetic acid is a carboxylic acid, and ethanol is an alcohol. If we look at the ester, we see we have no actual OH here, which means although it could hydrogen bond to some things through the oxygen, it doesn't have an H to hydrogen bond through. So this is the least polar um, solvent. Ethanol or acetic acid, both of them have OHs, but acetic acid also has the carbonyl group, which makes this the most polar. Of course, S, that makes ethanol in the middle. So ranking them in terms of um, polarity, acetic acid is the most, followed by ethanol, followed by ethyl acetate, which is the least polar. And again, here we're looking at the functional groups. And just as one other reminder, these are the exact um, molecules that you, um, the exact solvents that you use as your mobile phases. Part B, which also has to do with t t uh, TLC. It says, what is the approximate RF value of the two molecules below spotted on a silica gel uh, TLC bay and eluded with toluene? Toluene is methyl benzene. And then it says, explain. So we have naphthalene, okay, as our first. So let's look at its affinity for silica gel and its affinity for toluene, which again is methyl benzene. So this is benzene and that's a methyl group. So this is um, the two molecules it could potentially interact with. Well, silica gel, as we just said in the previous question, is polar. And naphthalene only contains carbon and hydrogen, is relatively nonpolar. So it's going to have relatively little or no affinity for the silica gel. What about the toluene? 
Toluene is methylbenzene. This is an uh, aromatic ring. This is very nonpolar. Nonpolar, nonpolar. So it has a strong affinity for the toluene. Therefore, we could say this should have a high RF, meaning it should travel pretty far on a uh, TLC plate. Up here we have a TLC plate. It should travel very far because it's going to want to follow the mobile phase toluene because it has a strong affinity for that and no affinity for the silica gel. What about sodium benzoate? Sodium benzoate is an, an ionic compound. So ionic compounds, we don't usually describe as polar or nonpolar. Um, we just call it ionic. But when we have an ionic compound, it's going to be have a strong affinity um, for the silica gel. So it's going to have a strong affinity for the polar silica gel. And it's going to have no affinity for toluene. So therefore, in this case, the RF is going to be very low. Now, if you want to give an exact number for high RF, you could say around 1. And for this one, you could say around 0, okay, because the RF is a ratio of how far the molecule travels versus how far the um, spot travels, so it has to be between 0 and 1. So if you want to give actual numbers, this one is about 1, and this one is about 0. Now, you can't know this for sure um, without actually you know, running them, uh, but it's a relative question just to understand what type of molecules are going to travel relatively far in a TLC and what type of molecules are not going to travel very far at all. All right, let's look at the next page. In the next page, it says, consider solid phase extraction using a C18OH column and blue dye number one. What effect will each of the following have? Sorry, there's some on a successful separation with SPE. Consider the effect, uh, each effect separately and explain. So, failing to condition the column. You'll recall that you would first condition the column with methanol and then with water to um, kind of spread out those long C18 chains and make them capable of catching this molecule. So, if you fail to um, condition the column, you will get poor separation. And you may remember in the lab, what this meant was you would see um, the blue color kind of dispersed throughout the, the um, SPE column. So my drawing skills are not the best, but we had some solid phase material here. And basically you would disperse it throughout this um, solid phase media and you'd see some blue color in there because we haven't separated out those C18s and allowed them to catch the nonpolar parts of this molecule. Performing the final um, elution to remove blue one from the column with water instead of methanol. Well, in this case, if and if we condition the column properly and we trapped our blue dye up in the top of our SPE column, if we elute it with water, the blue dye will not come out. So blue one will remain in the column. because the water is too polar and basically it, this is going to stay interacting with that C18OH and the water is not going to be able to pull it out. In fact, you actually washed the column with water and that blue, that blue line stepper stayed right here. When you add a more um, organic solvent, methanol, although it's polar, it's not as polar as water, this tends to um, release the interaction between the C18 with the nonpolar parts of this molecule, and specifically, methanol will wash the blue uh, food coloring out of the column. All right, number four, it says, for each part, so A and B, pick the molecule that will test positive. You know, show a color change. So ferric chloride test. Ferric chloride tests test for phenols. Okay, so this is um, the one where you had um, the ferric chloride, which is kind of a light yellow, sometimes almost clear color, and then it could turn, you know, a purplish color um, in the presence of a phenol. It depends on the specific molecule you use, the exact color it might turn, um, and the darkness of that color. However, it does test for phenols. 
Unfortunately, this is kind of a memorization thing. All right, next one, Marquis reagent. Marquis reagent tests for some aromatic rings. So um, here we have amphetamine, GHB, and ascorbic acid, commonly known as vitamin C. In this case, it's going to test positive for amphetamine because it does an electrophilic aromatic substitution, and it essentially brings two of these rings together, and basically um, that causes a color change. Um, so that is basically how it works. So take home message, ferric chloride tests, test for um, phenols and Marquis reagent, test for aromatic rings. I will mention with the Marquis reagent, there is um, some differences in color based on different drugs. So it can be a little more selective uh, than just simply testing for an aromatic ring. However, in this case, th neither of these molecules have an aromatic ring. So neither of them are going to test positive uh, for the Marquis reagent. All right, last one. It says, for each of the following molecules, identify the major IR peaks outside of the fingerprint region. Identify both the bond and the wave number range for each peak. So the first thing is we have a common solvent, toluene. Okay, this is going to have a CH that's not aromatic at approximately, I'm going to put it as less than 3,000 centimeters to the minus 1. And then it's going to have a CH that is aromatic at greater than, but around 3,000 centimeters to the minus 1. So you have these aromatic CHs, and you have this CH3 up here. So therefore, this is going to have both the regular CH, the non-aromatic or aliphatic CH, less than 3,000. And it's going to have the aromatic CH at slightly above 3,000. All right, let's look at the next one. All right, I'm going to start kind of going left to right. So here, we're going to have an NH, and that's going to occur at about 3,500 centimeters to the minus 1. Here, we have a CH aromatic, which again is going to be greater than 3,000 centimeters to the minus 1. Next, we have a C double bond O, which is going to be somewhere around 1,700 to 1,800 centimeters to the minus 1. And finally, we have an, I, should, I guess I should have circled those, we have an aliphatic or a CH non-aromatic, which is going to be just less than 3,000 centimeters to the minus 1. I will say that in the lab, you actually use the, um, the IR as kind of like a fingerprinting system, um, but these are just some general peaks, and if you've had organic chemistry, um, you've already seen these. If you haven't, um, you will see them in organic chemistry. Last one, ethanol. Well, ethanol, we have the OH and we have the CH, so the CH, it's not aromatic here because it's not in a ring, is going to be um, less than 3,000 centimeters to the minus one because it's not in a ring, and the OH is somewhere around 3,300 centimeters to the minus one. But one thing about the OH that's very um, uh, indicative of OH is that the peak tends to be very broad. So this gives a little bit of an idea of some of the peaks we could identify um, outside of the fingerprint region above about um, 1,500 centimeters to the minus 1 uh, using IR. I will also mention that C double bond C is sometimes seen as outside of the fingerprint region, but there's two things going on with that. One, a lot of molecules have C double bond C, um, especially drugs of abuse, and also there is a um, that's very close to the fingerprint region. So whether you put that in or don't put that in, I think it's kind of, you know, optional. Um, so said another way, if you put it in, great. If you don't put it in, great. So either way um, is acceptable. So I hope you found this uh, quiz helpful. It is a little bit more focused um, than the quiz that's on uh, Blackboard if you're taking this fall of 19. And I thank you for taking your time to watch this and good luck on your quiz.